Yeah, thanks for uh, you know coming. Um, and I, my instructions were to give a tutorial or overview of some of the things that I've been interested in over the last three or four years. So for the experts in the audience, my apologies up front. They will know what I'm talking about and probably know it better than I do. Um, for those of you who are not so familiar with it, hopefully uh, you might pick up something. And if you have any questions, just jump right in. And I'd be happy to try to um, answer those if I can. Um, so what I want to tell you about is <coughs> what I'm calling monitored or monitoring quantum dynamics which is a new type of quantum dynamics where one is repeatedly making measurements of the unitary dynamics of the quantum system. And the important point is that the measurements are not just reading out what's the dynamics that's there in the absence of the measurements. The measurements are playing an integral part in steering the quantum evolution of the quantum state. So the measurements can be viewed as sort of a random walk through the Hilbert space uh, and we'll talk about that and what that leads to when you follow, uh, follow the system. And so in particular, what I want to do is consider systems with, in principle, many qubits. So one's looking at the, it's called the thermodynamic limit, um, and looking at non-equilibrium dynamical quantum phases and phase transitions. And I'll tell you a little bit about a measurement-driven entanglement transition, which will have some uh, connections with some of the later talks. Um, and so hopefully will be helpful if you've seen that. Um, so, you know, most of us are here because of these new experimental platforms uh, for systems with many qubits, uh, ranging from superconducting qubit arrays to ultra-cold atoms and trapped ions. And the latest uh, member of the, the group are the Rydberg atoms, which I'm no expert in. They're probably are experts here, but they seem to be really quite, uh, uh, quite remarkable. And uh, so these new uh, platforms give new opportunities for quantum many-body uh, theory. Uh, and in quantum many-body theory, and I'm a quantum many-body theorist by, by uh, career, if you will, um, you know, we typically look at Hamiltonians. Um, and at least in the digital quantum simulators, one would be looking perhaps instead at quantum circuits with unitary gates and coupling together the qubits. Uh, in many-body theory, for electrons and spins in crystal and solids, for example, one would be looking at uh, ground states or very low temperature states, but in particular, you know, traditionally thermal equilibrium states. Um, and in the context, what I'll be talking about, we're looking very much at non-equilibrium dynamics on the one hand. The other hand, it's open quantum systems, quantum systems where one is coupling to, and in particular, focusing on the role of of measurement. Um, in uh, many body theory, one often is focusing on order parameters such as the magnetization M in a, in a ferromagnet. One also might be focusing on what are called topological phases, uh, and, uh, but usually looking at ground states. Um, and in the context of many body uh, 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 non equilibrium uh, systems, one might be looking at other quantum information. Uh, quantity such as quantum entanglement uh, and the entanglement entropy. Okay, so again, the interest here are quantum phases and phase transitions driven by measurements, really driven by measurements in open non-equilibrium systems in, in the uh, thermodynamic limit. And the common thread is entanglement entropy, which most of you I'm sure are very familiar with, but just to very briefly set the notation, so if one has a box with a quantum state psi, just a pure quantum wave function in the box, uh, one can write down the pure state density matrix as just an outer product of psi with itself. If one spati spatial partit partitions, excuse me, or bipartitions the, the physical system into a region A and region B, one can trace out in the density matrix the degrees of freedom in region B to get the reduced density matrix on A and that reduced density matrix on A tells one all the information that a, an observer living in region A would have access to. Um, and a very interesting quantity is called the entanglement entropy, which is the von Neumann entropy uh, in, uh, of the reduced density matrix on A. So trace A, row A, log row A. It's nonlinear in this reduced density matrix. 
And physically, it basically tells one the degree of uh, entanglement, quantum entanglement between the degrees of freedom in region A with the degrees of freedom uh, in region B. And the place where entanglement entropy has you know, played a very important uh, role uh, is in, in um, other places, it is in characterizing ground states and thermally excited states. Um, about 25 years ago, when entanglement entropy and quantum information theory was kind of coming up, you know, an old timer like me was saying, you know, why do we need density matrices? You know, why do we need entanglement? You know, what, what's this about? You know, entanglement entropy, what is that? Um, well, by now I'm a convert and, I mean, entanglement is quantum mechanics. I mean, that's what makes quantum mechanics different than classical mechanics, uh, non-local spatial entanglement. And so scaling of the entanglement entropy in equilibrium systems is very interesting. Uh, so if one takes ground states of Hamiltonians, which are gapped, let's say there's a finite energy gap above the ground state, uh, then the en entanglement entropy satisfies what's called an area law. So the entanglement entropy in region L varies with the uh, circumference of the region L. Here, little d is the dimensionality of the system, or just the dA here is the surface area of region A. So these are ground states basically manifest, you know, short range entanglement. And that's because the Hamiltonian consists of terms which are local, and the Hamiltonian and the ground states minimize the Hamiltonian, so they minimize the terms of the Hamiltonian which couple nearest neighbor or second neighbor qubits or spins uh, and lead to typically low entanglement or lower entanglement uh, than one would find where, than one would find in very excited states. So if you take a, a quantum Hamiltonian and look at excited states which have a finite energy density per volume, so very high energy excited states, kind of like thermal states, uh, they have, even though it's a pure state, a volume law entanglement entropy with entanglement entropy scales with the volume of the system, uh, and this is the modulus of A, is the number of quantum degrees of freedom in, in region A. So finite energy density eigenstates are non, very non-local, and basically, you know, everything's sort of entangled with everything else uh, up at finite energy density, and when, when things are free to move around at finite energy density, and everything gets entangled with everything else. Um, the, the approach to the high entanglement entropy is interesting, uh, and the precise nature of that entanglement uh, is, is interesting as well. Okay, but let me turn away from equilibrium uh, and look at entanglement dynamics, dynamics out of equilibrium, but still consider closed systems. Uh, so uh, what's drawn here is, is a some big quantum circuit uh, where time is running in the vertical direction. One has a bunch of qubits, uh, these red dots and evolving in time, uh, these red uh, rectangles are supposed to represent two qubit unitary gates. It's just some interaction between neighboring qubits. And this is a sort of a discrete version of the dynamics of a quantum Hamiltonian, discrete in time. And because it's a discrete in time, energy is not conserved. And in general, unless one builds in special energy, special conservation laws, such circuits like this can actually have no conservation laws whatsoever. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is, following these authors here, is consider in inputting a very unentangled initial state, which is just a direct product state, involving this circuit under the dynamics and pulling out at the end an output quantum state. Now, the input state is unentangled. This is the direct product state. So this is no entanglement whatsoever. But the output state becomes very entangled. The, the unitary gates lead to entanglement. Um, and the entanglement entropy spreads, it turns out, ballistically, uh, and at long time saturates the entanglement entropy so that the outgoing entanglement entropy uh, in units of log two for qubits is proportional to the number of qubits in this region A. So, th so the entanglement spreads realistically into the maximal entropy state. Now high entropy means low information and high entropy means high disorder. And, a and if you have too much disorder, th th you lose, sometimes lose physics. I mean, you lose structure, if you will, and you lose, uh, you, you lose, yeah, st structures. 
And so, you know, I've been interested in how to control this growth of entanglement. And one way to do that is by making, uh, making measurements. And so that's what I'm going to turn to, turn to next. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about quantum measurements and quantum uh, trajectories. So imagine we just have a single qubit, you know, A0 plus B1, and measure the Z component of the single qubit, um, a projective measurement I'm thinking of. And so when one makes a projective measurement, the wave function collapses uh, with certain born probability for that collapse. And you end up, if you measure the Z component of the single spin, either in the state zero with probability A squared or the state one with probability B squared. So in either case, if one this measurement is being made by an observer, the incoming pure state uh, splits into two trajectories and for a given measurement outcome, let's say zero, one is following on this trajectory. Uh, if the experimentalist found the outcome one, one would be following along this second trajectory. And if one starts making subsequent measurements, the quantum trajectories start filling out a tree where the, where the different measurement outcomes lead to forks in the, in the tree. Um, you can also make measurements via, uh, you know, talk about measurements via density matrices. Uh, and here uh, I'm considering if you start with a pure state density matrix, then after making a measurement, if you find uh, the Z component of spin, if you find alpha zero or one, uh, you get the reduced density matrix on alpha. On, on alpha. Uh, and so you can think about the density matrices as also undergoing uh, quantum trajectories uh, and splitting and forking when one makes, when one makes a measurement. Okay. So I was talking about the growth of entanglement from unitary dynamics and measurements and quantum trajectories. Uh, and the reason I wanted to mention the measurements is because they reduce the entanglement. Uh, measurement, local measurements reduce entanglement. So just to illustrate that is if Alice and Bob share a bell pair, so you can think of them each having a, a single spin a half, which is in a, in a singlet, uh, they have, if you compute it, the entanglement entropy between Alice and Bob um, is log two, it's maximal uh, entropy. High entropy is low information, uh, that means that Al neither Alice nor Bob has local information about their spin, because their spin is entangled with the others. But if Alice chooses to measure the Z component of the spin and finds it up, let's say, then afterwards Bob's spin is down, and the two spins, Alice and Bob's, are in a direct product, up, direct product, down. They're unentangled completely, and so after measurement, if you average over the measurement outcome, spin up or spin down, the um, average entanglement entropy after the measurement is zero. So there's an uh, inequality that you can derive that if you make measurements in region A or, or of Alice or Bob makes measurements in region B, that the average over measurement outcomes of the entanglement entropy after the measurement is always smaller than the entanglement entropy before the measurement. So local measurements uh, induce disentanglement. Uh, and they induce locality if they're local measurements. Okay, so once we have measurements, though, we have an open system. One has the experimentalist who is there making the measurements. And so I want to talk about open quantum systems. And there are really two classes, the you know, most common class, and then this sort of slightly um, newer class, the monitored class. But so for the you know, more familiar, hopefully, class of open systems, a system, it could be a bunch of quantum spins here, a couple to a bath or an environment. And if you start with an initial quantum pure state in these spins, that will rapidly become mixed uh, due to the entangling with the environmental degrees of freedom. Uh, the environment essentially measures the system, but the results are lost. Uh, and this leads to you know, decoherence. Uh, and the mixed state density matrix evolves with some equation either through quantum channels or if it's a master equation with um, uh, not uh, short-term memory, uh, Markovian memory uh, in the environment, uh, the equation that evolves a mixed state density matrix is a Lindblad equation. But the second class of open system, which is a little more specialized, is a system which is monitored by an observer. And so here, 
you have an initial pure state. It's measured, just like the single spin being measured. And it produces, uh, post-measurement, another pure state. So it stays pure. The observer keeps track of the measurement outcomes. The wave function evolves as a pure state. And the dynamics then is described in terms of an ensemble of wave function quantum trajectories. So here's the ensemble of wave function quantum trajectories. And at the end of a bunch of measurements, one ends up with a bunch of different quantum states, which depend on the measurement outcomes. Now, if one didn't keep track of those measurement outcomes, but just took the, uh, these quantum states, made the d um, density matrices, and averaged over the measurement outcomes, uh, one would be building in an, uh, an environment, if you will. It would be like the measurement apparatus becomes the environment. Um, and the density matrix becomes uh, mixed. And average observables, if you measure some spin property of one of these final states, it's just trace of rho bar O. Uh, so the average observables are linear in the density matrix. And with decoherence, this can be interesting situations, particularly if you cleverly engineer the dissipative environment. But more generally, with just a sort of generic dissipative environment, quantum effects are largely washed out. Um, and so open systems with decoherence, it's often difficult to find where the quantum mechanics is residing. Um, but monitor systems are a little bit different. So here, one considers a density matrix, rho sub n, conditioned on the outcome set of measurements m. And one can consider the reduced density matrix on some re subregion or bipartition region A. And then one looks at the entanglement entropy of each of these wave function trajectories. So one looks at the entanglement entropy of psi 1 between region A and B, the entanglement entropy of psi 2 between region A and B, and that's what's written uh, here. And then one can average that entanglement entropy over the quantum trajectories. So the ab one, that's what we're looking at, an ensemble of quantum trajectories and looking at the entanglement structure of the ensemble of those quantum states. Um, and that's a quantity, the average entropy over the quantum trajectories, which is nonlinear in the uh, entropy, uh, in, in the density matrix, excuse me. So it's in these monitored quantum systems which reveal a lot of interesting structure, entanglement structure in these output quantum trajectory states. And a model that you know, a number of us have been playing around with and variants of that are extended systems. By extended systems, I mean systems with many uh, qubits, uh, which are measured, which are monitored. Uh, and so here's what one might call a hybrid a quantum circuit, where it, there are unitary gates, these blue rectangles. But then scattered throughout the system are single qubit measurements. And depending on the outcomes of those measurements, one ends up with different quantum trajectories. So the unitary evolution in these hybrid circuits, the unitary evolution induces entanglement growth, and the qubit measurements induce disentanglement. And one expects, then, perhaps, to have a competition between the unitary evolution and the measurements uh, in these quantum uh, trajectories. Uh, so sort of the canonical model that one can look at, which has no uh, symmetries and no structure, is a random unitary quantum circuit uh, and then single qubit uh, measurements sprinkled randomly throughout the space-time manifold of the circuit. Uh, and you can run the circuit dynamics beginning with a direct product state, for example, run it to long times, and then look at and compute the output entanglement entropy uh, of these quantum trajectories averaged over the results of the measurement outcomes. Well, what is a phase diagram? Here's one got a system in the thermodynamic limit, at least I'm thinking about having many qubits. Uh, well, there's really only a single parameter, p, which I'm introducing, which tells you how often you make a measurement. It's sort of the density of measurements that are being made. So p equals 0, no measurements are made. You just have a unitary circuit, and that in spreads to a very entangled or volumely entangled state. When p is equal to 1, when one's measuring every qubit at every single time slice, uh, there's no entanglement or very little entanglement. And so one has an area law. Uh, and then if you look at the possible phase diagram as a function of p, uh, p equals 0 volume law, p equals 1 area law, you might guess 
that somewhere in between is a volume law to area law phase transition. And initially, this was somewhat controversial. And it, uh, there were arguments to the effect that the uh, even arbitrarily weak measurement probabilities would immediately kill the volume law phase and drive you into the area law phase. Uh, and the arguments were basically that the number of measurements you make in region A, if region A is big, are extensive in that region. And so the a lot of measurements being made reduces the entanglement a lot, but the uh, unitary set of unitaries only increases entanglement across the cut between A and B. So that doesn't increase the entanglement very much. And it, you know, I might have thought that the measurements would always dominate, and one would have an area law entangled phase with even arbitrary weak measurements. Now, that turns out not to be the case, and it's for rather interesting regions, which I might allude to uh, shortly. Um, so what we uh, now know happens is that there's an entanglement transition uh, in this monitored dynamic separating a volume law phase uh, where the quantum trajectory wave function is a volume law from an area law phase. And uh, my graduate student, Yao Dang Li, who's just recently graduated and is becoming a postdoc at Stanford, um, used some of the quantum information technology of Clifford circuits to explore this entanglement transition in hybrids, such as these hybrid circuits, which have unitary gates and measurement gates. Uh, but the unitaries are a special class of unitaries called Clifford and the single qubit measurements are in the Pauli basis so that uh, one can simulate very large system sizes. Now, for someone coming from quantum many body theory, this was a real surprise to me that you could simulate, you know, it's somewhat non-trivial dynamics for 1,000 qubits. Um, you know, it's restricted to this particular class, but nevertheless, you can get very entangled quantum states with Clifford uh, dynamics. Um, and in any event, what he found was that there's an entanglement entropy versus uh, system length uh, region A in the long time steady state exhibited a transition where there was volume law entanglement at low measurement rate and area law entanglement at high measurement rate with a transition between. So he confirmed this uh, phase diagram. And you can look at and try to locate the phase transition by looking at something called the mutual information uh, which locates the transition here. This circle is supposed to represent the system in one dimension with periodic boundary conditions. These are the qubits, if you will. And you can subdivide into regions A and B, and then the complement region to A and B, and define a mutual information, which tells you basically something about the correlations between A and B. And what one finds is that in the area law phase, there aren't very long range correlations. Uh, and so the mutual information goes rapidly to zero as the system size gets large. In the volume law phase, um, the, uh, the, the, the volume law phase in some sense looks like a thermal state, not quite, uh, and has short range correlations. Uh, and so there's not much mutual information between A and B either. And it's only right at the phase transition that there's a lot of mutual information. Uh, and this peak here gets sharper as you make the system size get, getting narrower. So this locates the uh, position of the transition. And you can then look at what the entanglement entropy does right at the transition and right at PC. And you find that it varies logarithmically. So the entanglement entropy A versus log L is on a straight line. So this resembles a 1 plus 1 dimensional conformal field theory. If you take, for example, the quantum transverse field Ising model in one dimension and tune to the transition, and look at a subregion A, the entanglement entropy of that subregion A with everything else grows as the logarithm of A. So this suggests that one might have some conformal symmetry underlying the phase transition at this critical point. And indeed, there's a lot of numerical evidence and some analytic suggestions that one does have conformal symmetry. And the details of this aren't uh, so very important. Uh, but basically, one considers this same you know, system with periodic boundary conditions, and now takes these regions A and B and changes the size and locations of those regions. One computes the mutual information, and if there's conformal symmetry, that mutual information should just be a function of what's called a cross ratio, something that involves the endpoints of these two regions A and B. Uh, but basically, with the bottom line is if you can compute the mutual information for all these different geometries, 
uh, and then plot it versus this cross ratio, all of the data that you take uh, falls on the straight line and collapses nicely. And that's you know, evidence for conformal symmetry at the critical point. Okay. All right, what I want to turn to in the reigning part of the talk is the nature of the volume law phase. Um, and it's actually uh, rather more interesting than the area law phase. The area law phase is essentially an unentangled phase with sort of weak entanglement. So it's almost like a direct product state. The volume law phase is very different than a random phase. Uh, it has some structure. And there's a background in the volume law phase. I mean, I mentioned that the entanglement entropy scales as the volume, OK, so in one dimension with LA. But there's a background piece, LA, to some exponent beta, which in Clifford is a little bit bigger than 1 third. And you can understand this background via mappings to statistical mechanics models, which uh, I think might be mentioned in some of the uh, uh, talks later in the, in the morning. Um, this is not my work, but there's rather beautiful work in mapping these quantum circuit models to generalized statistical mechanic mo to mechanics models where the space-time manifold of the quantum circuit, space and time, get mapped to the two-dimensional space of a classical statistical mechanics model with essentially classical spins living on these uh, green blocks. Um, and you can think of this as a bit like an Ising model. The model is a little more complicated that, than that. Uh, but it's a two-dimensional model in any event. Um, and you can ask, what are the phases in the statistical mechanics models which correspond to the phases of the quantum circuit? Uh, the volume law phase uh, corresponds to the ordered phase of the quantum circuit, turns out. And the area law phase corresponds to the disordered or paramagnetic phase. So if you think of this as an Ising model, when the Ising model is ordered, that corresponds to the volume law phase. And it turns out that there's a very nice and intimate connection between the entanglement entropy from the statistical mechanics, uh, entanglement entropy in the quantum circuit. You can extract that from the statistical mechanics model uh, by noting the equivalence between the entanglement entropy and the free energy cost of changing the boundary conditions on the statistical mechanics model. So you're supposed to imagine the statistical mechanics model, think of an Ising model, and you, on the top layer, at the, end, at the final time slice, you take uh, spins in region A and take downspin boundary conditions and upspin boundary conditions away from that region A. And you look at the free energy cost of that change in boundary conditions. And that basically puts in an entanglement domain wall. Um, it builds in the entanglement uh, that's there in the quantum circuit that you're looking at, at least, when you uh, compute the entanglement entropy. And uh, in the ordered phase, or the volume law phase, this entanglement domain wall uh, has a finite energy cost per unit length. It has a surface tension. And so the free energy goes as LA. And, and the entanglement entropy, which is equal to the free energy, uh, is volume law. So the area law phase corresponds to the paramagnetic phase of the statistical mechanics model. Um, now, fluctuations of the entanglement domain wall are interesting. Um, in this statistical mechanics model, if you look at it carefully, it involves a replica limit. There are basically logarithms which are entering, which need to be uh, changed into algebraic functions of powers, really, of the density matrix so they can be averaged nicely. And so there's a replica parameter m, which is taken to 0. Uh, here, if m were 1, the spin model would be the clean Ising model. If m is 2 or 3, you can look in the ordered phase at the entanglement domain walls, and they split into m domain walls with an attractive interaction. Now, it turns out that of m domain walls with an attractive interaction is identical to a problem uh, that's called a directed polymer in a random environment, uh, where you have you know, your random, your, your entanglement domain wall, if you will, or your interface in your Ising model or your replicated spin model with impurities. Uh, and the partition function for that is given uh, here. But if you want to compute the average free energy, uh, which is a log of the partition function, you have to introduce replicas. And you have a replicant xm again. Uh, and you map this random polymer, directed polymer in a random environment to an average free energy which is m-directed polymers with an attractor interaction in the replica limit. Um, so there's a, then this intimate uh, 
uh, mapping between the entanglement entropy in the volume law phase of the hybrid circuit and the free energy of the directed polymer in the random environment, which, uh, which you really can equate with one another. And once you've done that, you can use all the technology of the directed polymer in the random environment. Um, it's a model which has been studied for you know, 25 or 30 years. A lot's known about it. Uh, there's power law behavior. For example, this entanglement domain wall has a wandering exponent, which is bigger than the diffusive. Uh, the exponent zeta is 2 thirds. You can look at also the free energy fluctuations uh, due to the impurities of this entanglement domain wall, and there's an exponent beta, which is, around, which is equal to 1 third for that. So that the, the vector polymer in the random environment has these uh, critical exponents associated with their dynamics. And the Clifford uh, hybrid circuit you can look at then as well uh, in a confined geometry, because we can look at the directed polymer in the random environment in a confined geometry. And it turns out you want to start with a maximally mixed initial state to end up with a you know, free boundary condition on the initial time step. And uh, you can look at finite size scaling of the directed polymer in the random environment, which is on the right-hand side, and the subdominant entanglement entropy in the random hybrid Clifford circuit. Uh, and you get you know, a very nice agreement between both the critical exponents and all the scaling functions as well. So the bottom line is that, uh, that uh, the uh, volume law phase of, the, of these random hybrid circuits um, the background entanglement entropy, the, the LA to the one third, can be understood in terms of the entanglement domain wall moving through this random environment. But there's many different ways to look at this pure, the, the entanglement phase transition, and one particular very appealing way from Michael Gullins, who we'll be hearing about a, a talk later this morning, and David Hughes, was as in terms of a purification transition. Uh, so. Among other things, what they considered was the hybrid Clifford circuit, but starting rather than a direct product state, starting with a maximally a mixed state, uh, the, the density matrix at time zero is the identity. They ran that maximally mixed state for some time, which is linear in the system size, linear in the number of qubits. And now they're starting with finite entropy because they have a mixed state. And so they then computed the thermal entropy at time t. Now they're making measurements so the entropy is going down as they run the circuit. <clears throat> but what they found is that if the density of measurements was low enough, they weren't able to suck out all of the entropy. And even at long times, at least polynomial in the system size, uh, the entropy, some entropy remained in the system. There was some uh, hidden Hilbert space of states which were sort of untouched by the measurements. Uh, so they called this a mixed phase because the density matrix remained partially mixed. Uh, and when they made enough measurements, uh, the maximally mixed state, they were pulling out enough classical information, reducing the entropy enough that it became pure. And just one pure state was left. Uh, and they found this entropy density, uh, entropy, uh, thermal entropy density per unit uh, length uh, came down and had to transition at a value of PC, which coincided with the transition point for the entanglement transition between the volume law and the area law phase. So th they were basically looking at the, uh, uh, the flip side of the same coin. And it turns out that as far as the bulk physics is concerned, bulk inside the circuit, that the purification transition that they were exploring is really is the, is the entanglement transition. Uh, the difference is with the entanglement transition, you're starting with a pure unentangled state. And in the purification transition, you're starting with a, with a mixed state. Uh, so this was a very nice way of trying to understand uh, this entanglement transition and led to other um, clever ways of, um, rather than starting with maximally mixed states, starting with partially mixed states by entangling in scillas and developing order parameters for the, for the phase transition, as well as other things. Um, so, Returning to the, vol the volume law phase as a state which doesn't fully purify when the measurement rates are low, uh, it turns out that enables one to view the volume law phase as some kind of quantum error correcting code. Um, 
Now, it's, it's not really, I, I don't think, a quantum error correcting code per se. It's a, an encoder of quantum information. Uh, basically, the unitary gates scramble the quantum information that's held in the initial state. Uh, and uh, there is a, uh, at long times, the measurements tend to purify, but the volume loss stays mixed. And so there's a dynamically generated subspace of the Hilbert space, which is untouched by future measurements. It, it changes with time, but it's basically hidden from all future measurements. So you're hiding the quantum information. And when one's looking at Clifford circuits, uh, then um, this is um, a, a type of what's called an LKD stabilizer circuit, where L is a number of physical qubits, K is a number of logical qubits. There's a finite code rate, which is the entropy density. Uh, and there's something called a code distance, which is the shortest logical operator. And that, you can argue, varies with the same exponent beta of one third. Now, the reason I said it's not really a quantum error correcting code is because to have a quantum error correcting code, you want to decode. Uh, and that seems to be very challenging, at least in these random circuits. Um, so I've been talking about one particular example of a hybrid circuit which has unitary gates and measurements, uh, but there are lots of variants of this by taking enriched phases in such type of hybrid circuits. There's a paper uh, a couple of years ago by Ali Labassani at, um, at uh, Mason Bakeshley's group in Maryland um, where they took a two-dimensional set of qubits, a square lattice of qubits, and they started measuring the the toric code stabilizers, the terms in the toric code Hamiltonian, as well as measuring single qubit, uh, um, single qubit operators. Uh, and they were able to drive uh, a uh, transition from a, a, a topologically ordered state to a non-topologically ordered state. Um, there, you can look at measurement only mo models. Michael uh, Gullins and I think Vedika Kamani was on this, um, as this paper as well where if you look at uh, measurements which involve multiple qubits and those different measurements don't commute with each other, one can actually generate entanglement just by measurements only. Uh, Ehud Altman and others looked at symmetry enriched phases, such as symmetry protected topological phases like the Haldane phase. There's a, some inter very interesting work on putting in global symmetries, conservation laws, the U1 symmetry into these circuit models, and there's, I think, a lot of questions then, at least in my mind, which are not fully understood, even though some things have become clear. And then uh, Sebastian Deal, I think, is going to be talking later about entanglement transitions in monitored free fermion chains. Uh, if you have free fermions, which are hopping around on the ladders, and, uh, and you're looking at them, you reduce their entanglement, but uh, you, in fact, because of the fermions are free, it's, even when you look at them very weakly, the volume loss phase that they might have had is, is reduced down to a phase which can be logarithmic in system size. And then there's a transition that you can have into, a, into an error law phase. OK, so just in the last uh, few minutes, uh, I want to talk, to talk about experimental access. Um, and this is, you know, I've said um, in, in the past that this is a bit of the elephant in the room. Um, that it's these, these, exper these monitored quantum systems are hard to look at experimentally, and I'll tell you, you, know, tell you why. But on the, on the one hand, but on the other hand, they give us a, an opportunity to think about clever ways to actually be able to look at the transitions. And um, so remember, I, these monitored quantum systems, you can think of in terms of entanglement trajectories, and these final wave functions after making these quantum measurements reveal the phase transitions. Um, but if we look at averaging over those quantum trajectories, um, with PI being the probability that one had that particular quantum trajectory in this uh, run of the circuit, uh, this mixed state density matrix uh, washes out all of the effects. So this is, if you average over the quantum trajectories, uh, it's a bit like having a dissipative environment. Um, basically, the experimentalist makes the measurements, forgets the measurement outcomes, you just average over them, and it's like having decoherence. Um, so if you want to actually see the entanglement structures in these quantum trajectories, you need multiple copies of the same pure state uh, to measure the density matrix, you know, for example, via tomography to extract the entanglement entropy. Um, 
So basically, you know, if I give you a, you know, the ground state of a harmonic oscillator and, and tell you to measure the position of the particle, when you measure the position of the particle, you find it in one place. That's all the information you have. So in quantum mechanics, in order to measure the structure of quantum states, one needs many, many copies of the same state. You know, I have to keep giving you the harmonic oscillator ground state and you keep making measurements on it. Well, likewise, I have to, would have to keep having the quantum circuit giving, let's say, this first state psi one, but the problem is, even if you run the circuit once and you get psi one, the next time you run the circuit, you may get psi three and then psi five, and then you have to wait again to get psi one. So this is called post-selection. You have to post-select on the final outcome. But the post-selection, when the circuit gets big, becomes hard because there are a lot of measurement outcomes and this quantum trajectory tree grows exponentially. Um, so how can you overcome post-selection? Well, I think there's other uh, ways to think about this. One thing, one way is to try to access the transition via a local probe uh, by entangling one and spin to the system qubit, and then using measurement outcomes to decode via some sort of active feedback. And Crystal Noel uh, will be telling us about um, uh, looking at this uh, um, uh, way of getting around post-selection in a beautiful ion trap experiment where finding evidence for volume law and error law uh, phases. Um, one can also try to decode uh, with active uh, feedback uh, using neural networks. There's a very recent paper trying to do that. Neural network decoders for measurement induced phase transitions. Um, there's another way is to take circuits, quantum circuits, which are space time duals of unitary dynamics. So, which are unitary circuits, but when viewed in the, if, if time is viewed as the spatial direction, they look non-unitary, and they look like measurement uh, uh, hybrid uh, circuits with as if they have measurements, actually force measurements, and one can get some uh, mileage doing that. Uh, and then finally, Clifford circuits uh, are useful because the measurement outcomes can be forced. I mean, with a Clifford circuit, one knows so much about it classically, it's possible to, you know, on the quantum circuit uh, to force a measurement which takes you along one of these trajectories to get the same uh, state. Um, but uh, one other way uh, to get around the post-selection problem is just by brute force, by looking at smaller circuits. And there's this recent experiment by Austin Minich's group at Caltech, where he circumvented the post-selection challenge just by brute force using, this is on IBM quantum processes, superconducting quantum processes, using you know, some enormous amount of processing power, 5,200 hardware device hours. Uh, and basically, it was brute force, you know, running the circuit enough times to get post-selection, measuring the final states, the density matrices via tomography, and then just reconstructing the entanglement entropy. And relatively s small system sizes, four or five, or up to, you know, finally 10 or 12, you know, sees evidence which is at least consistent with having, having the transition there. Um, so let me just ra start wrapping up here then. So, you know, I say new opportunities in the noisy intermediate scale quantum computing era. There are more opportunities. There have been opportunities for a while. Um, but quantum many body theory and quantum many body theorists such as myself are enjoying learning some quantum information theory and trying to you know, look for novel phenomena that one might uh, be able to find in larger qubit uh, simulators. Uh, in particular, looking at non-equilibrium dynamics of, and you know, I think these monitored quantum systems are interesting. Um, to go beyond the monitoring, uh, uh, one can try to look at and include active feedback, which I already mentioned briefly. Uh, there's something pe which now people are calling quantum interactive dynamics, where uh, you have your quantum computer, your digital quantum simulator, you have an experimentalist making measurements, pulling out information, that measure, those measurement results are being acted on classically and then fed back into the quantum computer by modifying the unitary gates or the subsequent measurements that you're making on the quantum computer. And so with this, a circuit like this, you can do lots of different things. One thing you can do is active error correction. Uh, this is how, if you wanted to error correct the, the toric code, you would measure the so-called stabilizers of the toric code. Depending on the outcome of the stabilizers, you would do some classical decoding and then do some 
uh, unitary gates to get rid of your uh, quasi-particles. Um, but I want to view this, uh, uh, the, this circle of, of, of dynamical processes beyond active error correction. And you know, the kind of thing I would be interested in is can you get your quantum computer to behave like a superfluid, to behave like an XY ordered magnet? Um, you know, you're monitoring it, so you're measuring it, so you're keeping it cold. Uh, you're looking at the results of the measurements, you're feeding back, and you're trying to, trying to um, see if you can stabilize you know, different types of uh, non-equilibrium steady states that maybe would be difficult to access in other ways. Okay, so let me just uh, summarize. I mean, I've been talking really about entanglement transitions, but the most important thing, I've been talking about monitored systems. Um, and the quantum entanglement transitions occur in these monitored systems where you have a competition between unitary induced entanglement and measurement-induced disentanglement. And there are many open questions, and you know, some of them being explored, you know, ranging from you know, rather more theoretical questions like what's the conformal field theory for the 1D entanglement transition? Uh, there's another question which I, I certainly don't know the answer to, but if you have these random quantum circuits with U1 symmetries, what's the really appropriate statistical mechanics model for the entanglement transition when the U1 symmetry is present? Um, uh, decoders are, I think, an interesting error. Trying to decode the measurement-induced phase transition to beat out post-selection. I think there's some clever ideas there. Um, and then finally, looking for novel quantum dynamical phases in, in monitored systems with, with active feedback, you know, closing the cycle on this on this uh, picture that I had there. So, okay, let me, let me stop there and thank you for your attention.